What's up guys, coming at you from Shenzhen in a very similar manner to my video a couple of days ago where I just fire up the camera and have a chat with you guys after dropping my kids off at school. This is really the only time I have recently to just fire up the camera and make a video. My last one where I just kind of turned on the camera and had a random chat was more popular than I thought it would be. I thought it wouldn't be as popular as my more kind of planned out specific topic videos. Um, but um, it, it went all right, so I thought I'd do a follow-up, especially uh, on the topic of race and racism, because I got some pretty good feedback um, and some pretty good comments on that. Um, not necessarily uh, all agreeing with me, which I'll talk about in a second. And um, I sh I'll address also a couple of people, my long-term subscribers, they say they don't really think I should be talking while I'm driving. But uh, to me, honestly, the level of focus that it takes is the same as if I was speaking to somebody sitting beside me or um, listening to a podcast. I mean, that takes a lot of mental energy also, driving and listening to podcasts. And that's something I've been doing pr pretty much since I started driving. Obviously, back then, we didn't, we didn't used to call it um, podcasts. Uh, I used to listen to CBC radio. And then uh, when I did my first really long road trip, I bought these, uh, I think they were cassettes or CDs off of CBC. Uh, it was a David Suzuki special. David Suzuki is a scientist, a great scientist in uh, Canada, an environmentalist. Um, and I listened to his talk. And I'll tell you about something I really took away from that. And I really remember from that in a minute uh, because it's related to race also. Uh, but I'll make a small diversion to tell you about that road trip because I thought it was really cool. It was really fun. Um, and there's, uh, I think I could tie in a little bit of a race-related topic in there too. Because, um, so th what it was, the situation was, is I used to be a gamer. I'm not anymore, but I was playing like a Quake online. Uh, and that's back when, you know, people, a lot of people were still using 566K modems. And so these guys I was playing against, most of them, some of them were in New York, but most of them were in Ohio. They were concentrated in Ohio. And they were having a LAN party, which is you take your computers down, you hook them all up to a local network, and you can play Quake against each other with no lag. I was like, I'm in. I was like 18, 19 years old. So I put my my um, computer in the back of the car. It was a 1991 Golf GTI, uh, the 8 valve, not the 16 valve, red with the round lights on the front. Um, and I think that's an MK3. Uh, used to love Volkswagens. I had quite a few. I had a Volkswagen Corrado, also 95 Corrado, 95 uh, Volkswagen uh, Golf GTI VR6, really fast. Uh, major Volkswagen fan. But anyways, so I, I head down. I'm listening to the, the podcast on the way. But when I get there, um, the the guys who are there, they were a bunch of guys who, you know, like kind of small small town kind of uh, mentality and looking guys, you know, driving pickup trucks and stuff like that. And it was a group that I never thought I would be accepted into. Like if I were to look at them on the outside and I knew what they looked like before I went down there, I would have been like, there's no way these guys are going to accept me you know, a brown guy into their group. They were amazing. And I don't know if, um, I don't know if, 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 it's, if it's my problem. This is a stereotype or a misconception that I shouldn't be having to begin with. Um, but, uh, or if it was the fact that we were all gamers and that was what brought us together. And there's probably some valuable things we can learn from that about how to bring people together. But either way, it was really cool. Uh, completely different world. Uh, Ex-military guys, some of them were working for what I now call the military industrial complex. I think it was Lockheed Martin. Um, and uh, I didn't I didn't know as much about the military industrial complex. I didn't know anything about it back then, but I would have loved to have asked them uh, more questions. But uh, interesting group of guys, I, I, speaking of pickup trucks, I remember getting into one of the guy's pickup trucks when I was down there at one point. They wanted to go to the bar to drink, uh, uh, drink some beer. And while this guy's in the pickup truck, he's drinking beer. He's drinking his bottle of beer. I'm like, this is, I'm really in a different world. When I got to the bar, there's a guy, I got carded at the door. And uh, I give my Ontario driver's license. And it really confused the, the guy who was carding me. He's like, I, I can't, what is this? I don't know what this is. I need a government ID. I'm like, this is a government ID. It's Ontario driver's license. And uh, it threw him off. But then he looked at the birthday. And he's like, well, hold on a second. You can't come in here anyways. The legal drinking age in the U.S. is 21. 19 in Ontario and it's 18 in Quebec. So in Quebec you get a lot of Americans coming up when they're 18 years old to, 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 to drink. But uh, uh, overall it was an amazing trip, uh, really fun and um, com completely unrelated to any main topic that I want to talk about. But I thought it was just a 
cool side diversion with a little bit of a, a story about race and perceptions in there. But I want to talk about uh, jumping back, and I may do a little bit of jumping here because uh, this isn't really planned out. But the thing that I took away from the David Suzuki uh, podcast, uh, or whatever you want to call it then, because it wasn't really called podcast then, was, uh, to be honest, I don't even remember what the meat was of his show. Uh, uh, it was for sure something about the science or the environment. But the thing that always stayed with me was his story of why he does what he does. And he was talking about when he was a child, um, this was either his first-hand experience or... It, from his parents, but he, I, I'm pretty sure it was when he was a child, he was subject to the situation that was going on where the Japanese Canadians, Japanese Americans were basically rounded up and put in isolated areas because they were afraid of Japanese spies or something like that. Uh, there were some, you know, obviously it was back then during uh, the, 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 the conflict. And he said from that point forward, he always felt like he wanted to prove that he was worthy of being called a Canadian. And, 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 and the way he did that was by trying hard at everything he did and wanting to do something great. And, uh, and so that's why, I mean, he's a, you know, an amazing scientist and environmentalist now. He, he's absolutely amazing. But it's kind of a sad story underneath it all. Sad and I don't think inspiring is the right word. Even, you know, even this long after, I don't know the right words to describe the feeling I, I, I got hearing that story. Um, but it, uh, it, it, it allowed me to pick up things from other uh, visible minorities while growing up. And it all also allowed me to kind of analyze myself. And unfortunately, what I found is that sometimes I think the same underlying mechanisms that drove David Suzuki to do good also drives people in the opposite direction where they want to denounce anything that's related to the identity that they're trying to denounce. And I'll give you an example. There's a guy named uh, Gordon Guthrie Chang. He's half Chinese. His father is um, Chinese. His mother is uh, American of Scottish descent. And he, he's like, if you look on his Twitter, he it's just like nonstop China bashing. And I think one of the most distasteful things, one of the most distasteful tweets was when coronavirus was kind of uh, ravaging through China and only people were dying here. I mean, as far as we knew, it was only here at that point. Um, he said, now for some context, he's been predicting the downfall of China for 20 years. He wrote a book 20 years ago saying China and the CPC would, uh, would be no more or would crash within 10 years. And he's been trying to prove that he hasn't been wrong since then, even though he's 10 years overdue. But when the coronavirus happened, he said, funny it's it, or he didn't say funny first of all it was towards the end he said it's really interesting how we always thought we had to manage the decline of america in relation to china or something like that and who would have thought if it's funny that just a tiny microbe would be the thing that does it that that, that changes the course uh, of china or, or something along the lines of that i'll try to find the tweet and post it in the uh, description if he hasn't deleted it and uh it was just really weird to see him trying to uh, vindicate himself uh, and his predictions about China with this virus and even calling the virus funny. Um, he does some other weird stuff too. Like there was one video of him getting up on stage uh, during a conference and he was like, he was doing this like evangelistic kind of a chant saying, stop Huawei, stop uh, China, I think it was. <laughs> I'll actually play the video for you. I'll find the clip and I'll play it for you pay attention to the, the faces of the guys beside him too. They're just like, whoa, what's going on? And they, I don't think they were pro-China guys, but even they were like, this is a bit weird. I'll let you see it now. Stop Huawei, stop China. Stop Huawei, stop China. Stop <laughs> Huawei, stop China. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so that's it. That's how it manifested itself for uh, for Gordon because and the reason I say that is I saw a video of him talking about his childhood and even now as an adult when he describes who he is he says my name is Gordon Guthrie Chang Guthrie that's the white part of me and then when he says Chang his voice just becomes deep you know like kind of disappointed and and uh, this isn't just my imagination he's like he talks about how he wanted to fit in he grew up in an all-white town I know what that feels like I did also but for him, he really wanted to be accepted as an American, um, and he was targeted and bullied because of his, you know, the Chinese part of his identity. 
So now what I what I think is going on is he's just become so anti-China as a way to assert himself as American and as a way to say, I'm not like those people. I'm American. And what better way to assert myself as an American to do what's popular, what's the right thing to do as an American right now, and that's bash China. And it's really unfortunate because I think it will affect a lot of other overseas Chinese children who are looking at him and saying, oh, this is what I got to do to be American. You know, one of the most touching messages I get, and I've got these a few times, was um, from people who are overseas Chinese, uh, either they moved there or they're born there, and they thank me for debunking some of the really ridiculous anti-Chinese propaganda, because they say, you know what, they're in a position that where they've been really feeling ashamed of their uh, Chinese identity, and you may think, you may think, well, why, why is this happening anyways? Why do they have to be associated with what's going on in uh, China? But unfortunately, uh, that's how it works. I'll give you another example in a second. But they were happy to see some of the really ridiculous stuff debunked by someone so that they could be more proud of where they were from or where their parents were from. And um, I, I've seen this in other communities also that is not just the uh, overseas Chinese community. There was a guy who was uh, born in India who I remember, uh, he, he moved to Canada when he was really young. And he got up on stage and he was talking about how he felt offense at the question of where, uh, you know, where are you from? I, t I spoke about that topic in the last video a little bit. And he was talking about why it's offensive, why it's insensitive. And he says, look, look at me, I have a Canadian accent. Why do you got to ask me where I'm from? He was really also kind of proud of his Canadianness, And that's fine. But there was something, it was like a half an hour talk, I think. And there was something that was exposed in the middle where he says, you know... Uh, I'm from India, and, you know, India is associated with poverty and strife and all this stuff. And I was like, ah, well, that's what it's about, isn't it? It's not, it's not only about wanting to identify as a Canadian. It's about not wanting to identify with India because of the state of the perception of what India is like. And so because of that, when I debunk some of this anti-China propaganda overseas Chinese people become more comfortable with their identity, even though people may say that those things should not be associated with each other. They should be able to be proud of who they are without looking at the state of current affairs in China or the state of anti-Chinese propaganda. But unfortunately, um, that's, not, that's not how it works. The topic of identity is a rabbit hole that I'm opening that goes deep into a different direction, which I may do a separate video on, but I want to pull this back in to address some of the stuff in my last video. Um, you know, I spoke about the uh, idea of, well, how, you know, Biden's on his way in, depending on who you speak to. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, weird stuff going on right now. But Biden's on his way in, and all of a sudden, these uh, uh, closeted racists who are able to come out and um, show their true colors, they're going to go back into their boxes, and society is going to go back to um, pretending that everything is okay. When racism hasn't been eliminated, it's just those racists are... Um, keeping quiet again, if that's what happens. I don't know if you can put this cat back in the bag. To uh, what a lot of people said, um, especially in relation to uh, me talking about having dialogue with these people, is they said, you know what? We're, they, some people sp spoke about first-hand attacks or being spat on or being you know, called racial slurs so much more now than they ever have before. And they said, you know what? We're happy to put the cat back in the bag. It's all fine and dandy. You want to talk about having a dialogue and giving these people a platform, um, but uh, we're happy to be back to, to what we had before. And um, it's unfortunate because what, what we had before, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of, it's not so in-your-face racism. It's more uh, slow and steady racism, especially when some of these racists are in positions of power that can oppress people in a, in a, mo, a more um, uh, covert kind of a way when people are looking the other way and are complacent again and have gone back to sleep saying, not, you know, not realizing how uh, big the problem is. But for somebody who's got to live with the attacks and the slurs and everything that happens on the ground level, it's understandable that that is the better option. It's just what I was hoping was that the spotlight that has been shone, shown, shone, <laughs> the spotlight that we have shined onto this issue, it would be such a shame to just go back only to what we had before without having some sort of meaningful reflection about what just happened. And one other thing I said, which I, I didn't need to bring this example in because it, it opened up a whole other rabbit hole, um, which was I talked about the uh, VMP leader at the time, uh, Nick Griffin, um, Holocaust denier, being given a platform on the BBC and debating with somebody. 
and uh, having his ideas exposed and then lo him losing support from his audience. A lot of people said, well, why you, why you got to do that? Why you got to give these people a platform? Because you're not going to change their mind. And in that case, it wasn't about changing his mind. It was about changing the mind of the pe minds of the people who followed him. But granted, you could also say there's a lot of people who follow um, unsavory characters like that that are never going to have their mind changed. They're not going to. They're not going to have their mind changed. So why give these people a platform? And obviously, the discussion of why give these people a platform in the West is very different from why give these people a platform in China. It's a completely different set of mechanisms. You know, in China, um, when they when they censor something uh, which they think is going to be harmful for society, there aren't these kind of second layer platforms where people can go on and it can still fester underneath the surface in 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 a, in a similar way that it can in the West. I give an example like, uh, you know, after the terror attacks in China where uh, people were being sliced up in train stations and stuff like that, a lot of those images and videos were classified, they were censored, they were not released. They were re recently declassified, a lot of them, on the um, CGTN documentaries on terrorism. But I think there was an understanding that if those images went out, there could be a real divide that is created in society between the ethnic groups or, you know, Uyghur people, innocent Uyghur people could be blamed uh, for what those specific uh, uh, terrorists did, and there's a precedent for that. Also, obviously, after 9/11, uh, you know, the, the 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 conversation was allowed to happen in such a way that Muslim people were targeted and attacked in the West in a major way. Not only Muslim people, but anybody brown. There was a Sikh man who was stabbed in a gas station. Mosques were burnt and stuff like that. You know, speech in the West is free enough. It's not really free speech, but it's free enough to get you into a situation where you have a big problem on your hands and massive societal divides. And when you censor these people off of first layer platforms, they go onto second layer platforms. And then they can go underground in such a way where they're challenged even less by opposing opinions and they fester and they grow. And I'll give you an example of that right now. Uh, Tommy Robinson is a, is, a, is, a, is a guy from the UK, very anti-Islam kind of a character. I actually followed him for a while. I was, I was inspired by, this is going to be a little bit of a side story too. I was inspired by a guy called, I'm so terrible with names, Theo E.J. Wilson, I think it was called. I'll put the link to his TED Talk in the description. But he was an African-American who wanted to dive deep into the alt-right, into really kind of racist realms of it, and figure out what was their mindset, what's going on with these people. And he had to set up a whole new profile to do it because his regular profiles, Google, Facebook, they know, they know who he is already, and they feed you what you want to hear. They feed you what your personality wants to hear, which is a problem in its own. So what he had to do was he had to set up a new profile. He started making like racist com comments towards his own uh, you know, ethnic group, and he was in, and he learned so much from that, um, side of, uh, that side of society. So I did a similar thing, and I followed Tommy Robinson for a while, and I wanted to really figure out what was going on in that community. Um, but I got to a point where I just couldn't, I, I, I couldn't follow him anymore. Um, I actually spoke about this with uh, Danny Hyphone with my, you know, interview with him, and I'm gonna, I didn't air that part in the interview that I uploaded to, to YouTube, so I'll show it to you guys now for the first time. I'll show you that clip now. But I think um, an active effort to understand the other side also, I mean, I don't know if you saw the TED Talk by a guy named uh, E.J. Wilson, where um, he was an African-American guy who uh, really wanted to get into the deep right kind of culture and figure out what these people are about. And he couldn't do it under his own uh, profile, under his own Facebook profile on Google, because I already knew who he was. It already knew that you're not, you're not a right wing guy. You're not a deep right wing guy. So it was so hard to trick the algorithm because that's the other problem, right? Is our, our news feeds, they're designed for us. They give us what we want to hear. Yeah, they do. And so what he did was he had to set up an entirely new profile. And uh, as soon as he started to open up the profile, he started posting racist comments against uh, uh, black people and stuff like that. Him, he, I mean, he's a reminder, he's black. And to really get deep into that side. And then when he got over that, over to that side, he started listening to them. He started listening to what their real issues were, what their legitimate issues were. He started learning about their families and stuff like that. And, and, and kind of it, it personalized them a little bit. And I think it put them in a position to better understand what's going on. And, and of course, at a, at a better position to uh, potentially make a uh, positive change. I don't know if you know Tommy Robinson. Yeah, yeah, I've heard yeah. of him. Yeah. So 
so yeah, he's from this little town called Luton. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to start listening to this guy. I'm going to start following him and his guys and stuff like that and just find out what's going on here. The catalyst for me, the thing that really put me over the edge where I'm like, okay, I can't listen to this guy anymore was when he was uh, standing in front of a Muslim neighborhood and he was saying, um, he was saying, behind me, these buildings are full of terrorists. And I was just thinking, because it was a Muslim neighborhood, and you can imagine the types of followers he has, you know? Yeah. I was thinking, like, imagine being a Muslim family living there and your kids are playing in the playground there and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, you've got, like, these white nationalists who are being told by Tommy Robinson that these are all terrorists here. I, I would be freaking out as a parent. And that was when I was like, okay, this is this is too much. All right, so yeah, there's there it is. So um, on to the main point of Tommy Robinson. He was censored off of Twitter. He was censored off of YouTube, he, all of these places. But now he's gone underground. He has a telegram group. And that telegram group is growing and growing. And it's unchallenged by opposing opinions. And it's just festering in such a way that when it comes back up to the surface, we're going to have a pretty big problem. And... Um, this uh, this is what I'm afraid is going to happen with the uh, same kind of a situation when we just sweep this racism that we've seen um, in America and popping up in other places also back under the rug and pretend it's not there, go back to sleep, and not really be able to do anything uh, productive with uh, the, the with what we got the chance to see. So what are what are, what are the solutions? I don't know. You know what? Uh, I mean, I'm just my, my last video. I, I put out some ideas there. Um, a lot of people I know somebody else. I like I like the way they worded. It. They said a lot of people who experience racism, who you're asking to be a little bit more, you know, open minded or not jump on people too early who may not be ill intentioned, but just kind of slightly ignorant. They said a lot of people who experience racism, they have battle fatigue with this stuff. And that's a good way to put it. I, and I don't know what it is, and I, I I don't know what the answer is, and 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 I can understand why somebody would say it's not my responsibility as a victim to 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 have to educate these people and to figure out how we can do things differently. And fair enough, that's true. I mean, you, you don't have to, you, you, we shouldn't have this problem to begin with. But if you look at somebody else who I really like, um, he also did a TED talk, uh, Daryl Daryl Davis, I think his name is. He's, a, he's an African-American man who joined the, the KKK because he also wanted to, he wanted to figure out, uh, there were two things that was going on. One, he wanted to figure out from a child, how could somebody hate me just because of the color of my skin without even knowing who I am? They don't know anything about me. They only know the color of my skin. How can somebody hate me? So he joined the KKK to answer that question, but also it ended up reforming some people. He became really good friends with the Grand Master. He... Um, uh, you know, they were eating dinner together at each other's homes. and But even during that transition, the Grand Master or Grand Wizard, I don't know what the official name is for these KKK leaders. He said, I, I, you know, we can eat together, we can sit down together, we can talk together, but I want you to know that I still think I am superior. I am better than you. But eventually, he did end up changing. He did end up leaving the KKK and, and, and Daryl managed to completely reform so many people from, from inside. Um... So should other people go through that kind of an effort? No, of course not. I mean, how can, you know, everybody go through that kind of an effort? You've got your own lives to live and stuff like that. Not everybody can do that. But if you can at least take some lessons from that, saying how can we, how can we engage this problem better to actually affect change? Because obviously whatever has been, has been going on so far isn't really working. So if we, if we just want to leave it up to the, the, the side that is, that is racist to you know expect change or to just yell at them from afar uh fine i mean we can keep doing that but is there a way the people who are on the receiving end of this can do something different also i don't know i also don't know if there was if there was a way to institutionalize some of the uh, takeaways uh, the mechanics of what daryl did and why it worked and institutionalize that into society that that would be amazing um where whether it's Again, I don't know what the answer is. Having children interact in a more meaningful way from childhood. Um, but of course, you know, racism is, is, is a learned behavior for a lot of children who grow up to also be racist. So if the reform happens on a childhood level, th will it really make a difference? I don't know. I, I don't know what the answers are. But I think it's important to have this discussion. One thing that is unfortunate that I'll tell you about is that... Um, <laughs> You know, there's uh, uh, there's over 50, was it 56 uh, ethnic groups, recognized ethnic groups in China. And there is, um, 
there is a level of cooperation and there's a level of pride about all the different cultures in China that doesn't exist in the same way in the West. But everybody's so convinced that ethnic minorities are treated so badly here that they're not even willing to look at how does China how does China uh, deal with this issue? And it, it, it's really unfortunate because I have never I have never ever met a single Han Chinese person who is not proud of the cultures the multiple cultures they have in China. I'm sure there are some. I mean, there's bigoted racist people everywhere. But there's a level of pride here for all the different cultures that I just haven't seen um, anywhere else in the West. Everything else seems superficial compared to that. I mean, even on the actual money here, they have the uh, script. The, the you know they have uh, Arabic, they have um, the, uh, Mongolian language, they have written right on the money, and uh, the national currency here. And maybe people might say that that is a superficial thing too, but. As much as as much uh, uh, anti-China propaganda as you want to consume, you got to sometimes look at the facts. You got to look at even the irony that you know um, Inner Mongolia is the target of some um, propaganda now, saying that they're trying to wipe out the language when actually it's just introducing more. Um, uh, it's introducing more Mandarin, especially to equip. Um, children to be able to enter these other universities, you know, mainstream universities in China and all kinds of other stuff going on. I don't really want to get into that into too much detail. Um, but they're still using the original Mongolian, you know, ancient script in, Mon- in Inner Mongolia. They're not even doing that in Mongolia, who had been influenced by Russia, Soviet Union. Um, so there is, there is in, by some measures, more authentic Mongolian culture in Inner Mongolia than there is in Outer Mongolia. Now, how is that for cultural pre- pre- preservation? You know, I I even went to as far as... um, I mentioned an MP uh, to you guys in the last video. uh, 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 An Inuit MP um, in Canada from the NDP who got up and was talking about how her community is not receiving any support from the government, not even the promised support. And I actually... I actually... uh, I I, I tweeted at her and I said, you know what, You you should come over to China... And go to, uh, you know, go, go, go to Tibet. I'll, I'll take to some of the places I went to and see how they manage um, cultures here. You know, I went, to, I went to a school in Tibet and I saw how they were learning, you know, uh, Mongolian, mu- oh, sorry, Mongolian, back to Mongolia, Tibetan music, dance, calligraphy, learning how to input um, Tibetan characters into the computer, bringing back old Tibetan culture, you know, the, the uh, a style of tanka that had been lost for 500 years, and, and what they're doing, how they're building the schools, what kinds of poverty alleviation programs they have. And I said, come over here and see it for yourself. I thought that would have made an amazing set of videos. Not only to have somebody from Canada come over, from the native community, to come over and say, holy shoot, If Canada could do even half as much of this for our community, we would be so much further ahead. Not only from that perspective, and then obviously when she goes back, it'd be pretty hard for people to say to her, oh, just shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. It's easier to say that to a white guy coming over saying, oh, whatever. But to say to a native person who's been waiting their whole life for support from the Canadian government saying, hold on a second, what's happening in China is exactly what we've been asking for for my whole life. I mean, that would have been an interesting thing that could have potentially affected real change. But also from a more uh, entertaining point of view in terms of, uh, I would have been really interested in seeing um, this MP come over and compare native cultures in Canada to Tibetan culture. Because when I was there, I I had been to some like uh, native dances and like reserves and stuff like that in Canada. And I couldn't help but notice when I was in Tibet, there were a lot of similarities. And maybe it's only to my untrained eye, but it would have been so awesome to compare native culture in North America or Inuit culture to Tibetan culture and see if there were any uh, similarities or just even get reaction videos of what it's like for um, for her to, to witness this kind of culture firsthand. It would have been a really cool video. But um, we're, 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 not, we're not at a point, nobody in, in North America, no politician in America would ever say, all right, so we've got a racism problem. We've got, you know different groups, different ethnicities trying to live together, figuring out how to work together. How do they do it in China? You know, they've got some successes in China. They've still got some challenges. They don't get everything right. But how about we look at China? <laughs> no <laughs> no politician would ever dare say that. And it's unfortunate. 
uh, because uh, there's probably some things that can be learned uh, uh, here in that regard. Um, there were a few other things. Um, there were a few other things I wanted to mention, but this video is like almost half an hour. I got to cut this off here. If you guys want to hear more of these random rants, I don't know when I can do another one. As I said, it's a busy, uh, busy couple of weeks. But I'm going to cut it short here, and um, I'm okay with not wrapping this up with a nice. Uh, conclusion because there I don't know what the conclusion is for this but I was really um, interested by the level of conversation that my last video um, provoked and I'm hoping that this might do a similar kind of thing and maybe some people some people uh, in the comments have some actual ideas about what can be done um, to approach this problem in a more constructive way where we can actually realize some actual uh, progress I don't know guys but I'm gonna wrap it up here and I'll catch you in the next video peace